And when you hear that theme song, you'll always see me coming out of the theme song. We play off a lot of uh, different guests. We keep it contemporary and lively. And uh, once in a while, we get in that nostalgic mood. And today is the day. Today is going to be kind of a milestone day for me and I believe for you. People always, uh, invariably people, when they know that I've been on TV now for about 30 years and I've done about 67,000 interviews, they say to me, Joe, do you have one highlight interview, one program that sort of stands out in your mind as your favorite program, one that's more or less engraved in whatever might be called the mind up there, and the answer is uh, unhesitatingly always yes. There is one favorite, and that's my hour, or my half hour, uh, with Bing Crosby. It was Bing kind of in the twilight of his career, still at his peak, but in the twilight of his career, reminiscing over uh, his life and times and uh, sort of putting himself down. For that one program, I've been told, it was not the usual Bing. He wasn't cautious. He wasn't uneasy. He wasn't the superstar of the world. He was just Mr. Everyman reminiscing with me. And today, my friends, by popular, as they used to say in vaudeville years ago, by popular request, because there isn't one day that goes by that at least a half a dozen people don't meet me in the street and they say, Joe, how about a rerun, a repeat of that tape, of that videotape? Today, is that day. Today is going to be, as we said, a highlight day. My favorite show, and uh, as I've said maybe on the panel to other people, but never when I'm looking into the camera and talking to you, that was the one day that I melted. I really melted because I've always thought of Bing, I had as the most of the world had thought of Bing, as being sort of mechanically reproduced. You think of Bing Crosby on radio, on TV, on movies, on records, but when Bing Crosby came into the studio and walked toward me, flesh and blood, not mechanically reproduced, but real, I just, uh, I got kind of a uh, feeling, a feeling of uh, melting. And today we're going to bring back my favorite program and to put you in the mood, and put me in the mood, a touch of the young groaner. A little bit of music by Bing Crosby, then on with the memories. Won't you tell me when we will meet again, Sunday, Monday, or always, and always... This will be my favorite show as we travel down the uh, road to nostalgia and watch the interview that I will never forget. This one, back in the 70s. Look at here. Hello, Bing. Did you know that you inspired my Bob Kane to create, that uh, creator, Bob Kane, to create me when he started his career? He was always one of your greatest fans. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been in this business of interviewing people for about uh, 23 and a half years now, but you've never, and, and I've interviewed every super duper star. You've never heard me once ever say that my guest is my very number one favorite entertainer. I want to ask just our crew, because we don't have any studio ones, just our crew, how do you feel about Bing Crosby? Thank you. That's, that's a real warm reception, Joe, and I appreciate it. And I'm and glad to be in this environment. All these friends here of yours and of mine, and let's talk about something. Glad to be in the, big, their interest. in the Big Apple. The, this is really the big A when you're here. And the biggest joy in the Big Apple these days is the big news that Bing Cro and, and Catherine uh, will she's come gonna, in. She's going to come on a little so later. Right? She's all primed and ready. She's that they are dying. going to be at the Eurus Theater. Eurus Theater. We open uh, December 7th, and we play through the 19th. And uh, we've had a little act we've been doing. We did it in Europe last summer, and we did it. We've done it in uh, Houston, New Orleans, San Francisco. It's all for charity. We don't take any money. This charity locally is going to be for the uh, Manas School of Music. And there's a little story connected with that because Risa Stevens, who's the president of the Manas School of Music, did a part in a picture that I was in called "Going My Way," and she played an opera singer, which she was in real life who came to this little community to sing at a benefit to raise funds for the church. And now here I am singing in New York to raise funds for her school. So it's a quid pro quo, whatever you say. That's the way to And say the it. other uh, beneficiary is to be the Association for the Help of Retarded Children. That's at the Eurus Theater. And as Joe's just been kind enough to allow me to put in this very substantial plug. I've already bought my tickets. My advice is don't wait too long. We'll talk about the Eurus uh, with uh, Catherine Crosby, who is Mrs. Bing Crosby. We'll invite you in a couple times today. We'll talk about the family who will be part of that uh, bill. And my guest, as I said, is the most uh, beloved entertainer ever. His name is Bing Crosby. And Bing, 
Uh, I just met a fellow who says to me that uh, he was with you back there. He says all the singers at the Paramount used to used to sort of uh, warm up their pipes by singing the scale, but you would just walk out cold. Yeah. And you didn't want. You didn't have to gargle or warm up the pipe. You just walked no, out. Nothing would help me. I just had to take my best shot and, and pray that it would work. You know. Started out singing. Sometimes it did. Sometimes it didn't. You're talking about Randolph. I guess. Randolph. Randolph worked with me for many years around New York. And he, and he looks great. He's in great shape. And his son drives for you, I understand. That's right. That's right. It's uh, full circle well, you now. you see, we've come full circle. Yeah. Full circle. Yeah. And uh, so far... Also on the bill with me at the Eurus will be Rosie Clooney, whom I know likes you and you like her, and uh, Joe Bushkin and his jazz quartet, an English comic named Ted Rogers, who I think you'll find amusing, and, of course, Catherine and the family, and then I bark a few ditties in, in and out, you know. A whole bunch of ditties. Grown dads. a few, yeah. A whole bunch of ditties. Uh -huh. That was nice what you did in Las Vegas for the uh, church. Yeah, there, well, Vegas. this little padre uh, was saying mass in a saloon every Sunday. He didn't have a church. So I went up there and did a show, and now Frank's going to do one, Sinatra, and we'll get uh, uh, Perry to do one, maybe Tony Bennett. Bing, and Bing. By spring, he'll have enough money to build a church. That's a couple of churches. Bing, all these radio tapes that they sell around the world now of old Bing Crosby radio. Mm -hmm. or are they legal? Are, are any laws being broken when they sort of... Uh... No, you're stuck. We can't do anything about that. It's like the old pictures they run on television. Right. Nobody gets anything out of it except ASCAP. Right. Songs that are used, they have to pay a certain amount for the songs, the publishers. And, of course, the, those pictures that they're rerun, it'd be a nice thing if some of the actors who worked in those pictures, who played small roles and are now, could use $100 if they... But it's, uh, they went to court twice. I think Gene Autry went to court. So did Roy Rogers. Tried to... And so did George Stevens, because they were editing his great pictures down into uh, where they didn't resemble the thing that he had created. And right. he tried to stop it. But the judges ruled that when you made the picture, you, you uh, abandoned your claim to any further rights. That's Although, it. If the fellow who worked in the picture thought he was making a movie for a picture house, and now he sees it on television eight or ten times, and he doesn't get a nickel out of it. And they could use the money. Doesn't matter to me financially, but I'd like to see them repaid. And the same thing applies to the records or the tapes. You made them for a record company, and that's you get a royalty or sale of records, or then that's it, and you're through. Bing Crosby is a man who knows the law and the ramifications of the law, and it's interesting that I once uh, read about a company called Bing Crosby Productions, where you produced Ben Casey. Yeah, and, and a couple other series we had that went pretty well. Ben Casey was the biggest. Hogan's Heroes, I think. Hogan's was Heroes went ran and ran and ran, but uh, it's a tough business of producing for it television is. because there's so many pilots made every year, as you know, Joe, and only a few of them can succeed and get on the air. Lots of pilots get on the air that are great, great shows, but they're against some competition that uh, just kills them in the ratings, and they're taken off after a few weeks and never get another shot, even though they might be great. It's a shame. It's a, a battle. It's a real bloody battle. A lot of bloody violence going into TV shows thousands, nowadays, thousands too. Thousands of dollars. A lot of money down I mean, a lot of violence in TV nowadays. Well, so that's far. overdone. Yeah. That's overdone. Yeah. I think it inspires a lot of kids to, who just see this on the screen, and, and it, violence is done by people that appeal to them. Uh, actors who were really their idols. I said, well, I'd go out and hit somebody in the head to see how it, what happens. I, it's people who don't have any goals or any aims. They're aimless and just, uh, they're influenced by this. I don't think it's a good thing. Sid, I was on a memory lane cruise. I took some old timers on a cruise and I got to give you one name. He's no longer with us, sadly, but he always spoke about you and the Hotel Belvedere. Yeah. Sid Gary. What Sid is... Gary, the master of the double top. Did you know him? He was on my, uh, he was my, one of my closest friends. You know, he he was really the fellow that started double talk. Before. And he was the best. Right. The greatest, because he had a real professorial appearance. He dressed very, looked like he's going down to Wall Street or somewhere. Right. And he'd get a total stranger, like there used to be a house detective at the Belvedere Hotel. He was an Irishman, or a green derby. I'll give you an idea. And he was a real stolid sort of an Irishman. And Sid Gary, anytime we come in from a cafe or a restaurant late at night, he'd get this guy and give him about a 15-minute routine of double talk. And the guy didn't understand a word of it, but he'd just keep yes and Sid. Yes, Mr. Gary. And Sid would say, you know, on the Prowling time, there's a Gadarim side there. And you get the Prowling, and the reason against the Prowling side, the guy said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Sid was a great singer. Did you know that? He was a good singer. He had his Big own. voice. Big, yeah. strong. He'd do the road to Mandalay. And those big, epic kind of songs. He was a baritone. Brother, Spare Me a Dime. Right. Did you, you ever hear him sing that? Sure. Bing, there was once a battle of the baritones on the radio. You opposite Russ Columbo. Yeah. Now, and Valley was in there somewhere, wasn't Valley, he? Valley. Well, there was I a think big, he ran third. There was a big song, Crosby. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a photo between Russ and I. Just a wild, hypothetical yeah. thought. Yeah, uh, just a pseudo had, feud that they cooked. Had, up, yeah. uh, had Russ Columbo lived? Yeah. Had he lived? Would he have uh, been as popular? Great star. I tell you, he was a handsome guy. Right. And he had a warm, ingratiating personality. And he could sing. And he was a good musician. He played wonderful violin, you know. Right. 
And I think if he'd have lived, he'd have been a big romantic star. Time I knew him the best, we worked together in a band at the Coconut Grove in Los Angeles, the Gus Arnheim band. And we sang some duets. We sang in quintets with the Rhythm Boys. And uh, we were great pals. And he was going with Carol Lombard. You remember her? Of course. Beautiful woman and a great personality. And she was crazy about him. They would have been married, I'm sure, if he hadn't been killed. Sad, mysterious uh, death. Well, it was. I know, I know the facts, and they're probably a little gruesome. We wouldn't want to repeat them here. But his mother, it was an Italian family, and he had three older brothers. And she had a serious heart condition, and they never told her that he'd been killed. They just wrote letters from London. They had London mail sent from Italy and said he was on tour. Right. And she died a year and a half later without ever knowing that he'd been killed because they were sure if she had been told, she'd have died immediately. But she lived on maybe 18, 20 months mm. before uh, they, need, then they, they, they knew they didn't have My. to consider the deception continued any longer. My guest is Point the... That was a sad story. My guest, ladies and gentlemen, is the man who has sold more records than anybody else, more hit movies. Now, uh, somebody... That may be a fiction about the records, uh, Joe. You can't... You think the, you Beatles, know, well, you think know, the, the Beatles came close? I think they must sell more, yeah. When you think of... These days, uh, there's so many more record buyers, so many more people have playback machines and all those stereo sets. In those days, gee, if you got a record to sell 100,000, you were having a big sale mm -hmm. way back there, you know? So I don't see how that could be true, but uh, the figures are put out by the, the record companies. I'll have to check that over and see if I got paid on all those royalties. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to believe if they sold 400 million records. I didn't get that much money, Joe. Being the... Uh, but I'm glad to get anything, you know. You did fair. You did fair. The, the fellas who impersonated you in vaudeville, including Sid Gary, and, and when they would do that boo 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 yeah. I, I used to wonder, did you ever really... Like they say, like Cary Grant never said uh, Judy, 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 and yeah. Betty Davis never said this, and Humphrey Bogart never said, all right, Louie, drop the gun. Uh, people have asked me, because I'm supposed to be somewhat an authority, did Bing Crosby ever really go boo, 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 boo when he sang? Yes, there's a couple of records, uh, I think, in Learn to Croon from a picture called College Humor. Was that on purpose or before? No, before it was considered very classy then. <laughs> You know, then it, from Boo Boo Boo, they went to Vo Do Di O, and then right. Hi Di Ho, and then Ha Cha Cha, and then Hey Hey. But now, these scat singers now, Joe, are fantastic. You take Ella Fitzgerald, Mel Torme, Cleo Lane, they take a scat chorus now. It's light years ahead of anything I ever did, because I just Boo Boo Booed when I couldn't remember the words, you know? <laughs> these people got arrangements, and they do intricate harmonic patterns and key changes, like Mel Torme. He's like a whole orchestra, the things he can do. Have you ever had him on the show? About 40 times. He's great. Mel is great. He's great. I think he's the, one of the best nightclub entertainers I've ever seen. He does a great act. Do you have one favorite uh, Bing Crosby movie or Bing Crosby record? Ah, uh, the big movie for me would be, because it was the most enjoyable, would be High Society. Right. With Frank Sinatra and Grace Kelly and Louis Armstrong and all the uh, Celeste Holm and under Chuck Walters and at the end of the ages of MGM, they were the marvelous music department, Saul Chaplin, and wrote all those special songs like Did You Ever For Us, and the great Cole Porter score, let's not forget that. That was a very enjoyable motion picture experience. Anything Goes, I think, was made twice. Twice, I made it with uh, Ida Lupino and Ethel Merman, and with uh, uh, Donald O'Connor, Mitzi Gaynor, was it Mitzi Gaynor? Yeah, you've Mitzi got, Gaynor. You've got and phenomenal and, uh, recall. And uh, the ballet dancer from France, uh, John Mayer. I was reading in the uh, book about uh, movies where they said that your first attempt at serious, serious dramatics was in The Country Girl, but 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 going my way and The Bells of St. Mary's was, even though it was schmaltzy, that was... that was. Well, it was just Bing Crosby with a, his collar turned around. Right, right. There was no acting in that. No. Really, it was a pleasant guy, sang some nice songs. But in Country Girl, uh, they really uh, challenged me, and I had a great director, and he guided me intelligently, and and it came off rather well. Were you eager to work with uh, Grace Kelly at that time? Was yes, because that... she's, you know, a good-looking girl and good, a lot of talent. And I knew her father very well, Jack Kelly. Right. And, uh, of course, her uncle, uh, the Virginia judge. Did you ever know him? The uh, Walter C. Kelly. Walter C. Sure. Kelly. I didn't know him, but I read Well, him. he was a great guy. He belonged to Lakeside Golf Club in his declining years, and we used to play cards together in checkers. Very funny man. Bing, you got to tell me. And her, her other yeah. uncle was a playwright, George Kelly, who, who wrote, wrote the show off. Right. And one other great hit. Right. We had Constant Nymph, was that his? Right, probably. We had Jack Kelly here, the brother of Grace Kelly, about a month yeah, ago. Yeah, he was an Olympic oarsman, and his father was an Olympic oarsman. You've got to tell, tell me who's a non-golfer. I think there's a few non-golfers. Uh -huh. what, what's the reward? What's the relaxation? What's, what's the, uh, what, what makes a person different on the golf course? from? Well, if you take the game seriously, uh, Joe, you want to play well. Right. And the only way you can play well is concentrate completely on what you're doing. 
And if you've gotten far enough and along in the game, so let's say you're a six, eight handicap, you want to try and break 80, and you're bending all your energies and all your thoughts, and all your concentration is directed in toward that goal. And so you can't really be bothered or obsessed with anything that uh, business, family problems, social problems, or anything else. You're concentrating on hitting the proper shot at the proper time. And when you get through 18 holes, you're never tired. Never. You're never tired, you're completely relaxed. You've had some laughs if you're playing with Hope or somebody like that, or Phil Harris, where there's a gag a minute, you know. And can you still break 80 on a good day? Yes, I can, yeah. That's great. If it, of course, it isn't too long. I, I, my drive is a little ladylike. I was playing in the, in, in the Pro-Am with the LPGA, you know, the Ladies Professional Golfers Association. Well, these ladies now that play professional golf, I played with girls like uh, Virginia Van Wee and Glenna Collette and Babe Dittrickson and Peggy Riley and Patty Berg, all the great women golfers. Right. These girls are 40 to 50 yards longer off the tee. And I was playing with a foursome with Sandra Post in this tournament in England. Right. And there was quite a crowd. And uh, I hit a pretty good drive. And somebody in the gallery said, nice shot, Bing. And I said, no, I thought it was a little ladylike. She chased me down the fairway with a wedge. She says, don't you ever say that again. <laughs> I'll hit you with this wedge. But it's just remarkable how far they can hit the ball, these girls. They're getting, they play, they're oh. getting better. We're going to have two of them play in our tournament this year at Pebble Beach, two amateurs. Uh, the lady who's the national collegiate champion, Nancy Lopez, and the national amateur champion, her name is Horton. Good people. And they're going to be the first women ever to play at Pebble Beach in a pro-am. So the barriers are creaking. They're slowly breaking down. They're breaking down. The yeah, but these are great golfers. And uh, they'll make a mark in the tournament, too, because as amateurs, they're going to play for the men's tees, and they'll each get seven shots. Does Catherine play? Yes, but she plays, uh, can I have my druthers? Right. You know, she hits one shot, and if it's a bad shot, she says, I want to take it over. <laughs> By that time, you're walking down the fairway, and the second shot she hits goes right over your head, just about hits you. So I had to stop that. We play now. I can, you can only have a second shot off the tee. You can have a mulligan. But after the ball's in play, you can't have any overs, no druthers, nothing. I'll tell you who was on my program one time with Mel Torme, another, another uh, Catherine Crosby with Bob Crosby. Yeah, was his daughter? His daughter, yeah. Kathy Crosby. She's a good singer. Are you she proud of She's the... married and doesn't work anymore. Are you I don't proud think. of your brother Bob and oh, the Bobcats? He's done one of them. What an organization, that Bobcat. You know they have a group now called the, the Greatest American Jazz Band. Have you heard of them? Sure, we've had them here. They have Bob Haggard and Yank Lawson and right. Cuddy, all those guys. Good group. Yeah. Did you ever bring ever... Uh, we're talking upbeat and happy, which is nice. There's so much uh, aggravation and hatred in the world. Oh, when yeah. you talk nice things, it's nice. But did you ever turn down, do you ever reject, let's say, ever turn down a song or a movie or any project that, not that you regretted it later on, but something that you, you could have had, but it turned well, out. I can think of a song that's, that's pertinent. Uh, but, I, I did a picture called She Loves Me Not. Right. And we had a song in there called Love and Bloom, and I didn't like it. Didn't like it. I sang it in the picture, but I, I just uh, kind of did a record and threw it away, and it wound up Jack Benny's theme song. Uh, now nobody connects me with the song at all, and, and uh, it's become his, or was his, you know. Did you introduce Stardust vocally? No, no. I think a lot of guys sung it before Stardust, me. Stardust, right. It was written by Kogi and Mitchell Parrish. What do you want to say to the many fans of Connie Boswell who oh, watch me every single morning? A dear every... woman, a brave woman. Wasn't she? A lot of courage and loaded with talent and humor. It never tired. I worked many times with her on stage, on record dates, always in a wheelchair, never complained, always up, up all the time and ready to sing, ready to go, big voice, little voice, whatever you wanted, harmony, comedy, she was full of gags. Great lady. I never met a braver, more courageous lady. There was a man years ago named Bob Bazooka Burns. Oh, great guy, Died marvelous. Young. He was one of the greatest guys after dinner speakers I've ever heard. Really? Better than Hope or anybody, he, or a luncheon, things like that where he could get up and talk about the people there. One of the best. That, that, that pairing of you and Hope, and of course Dorothy Lamour made it a trio. Yeah. How did that start? That started well, with... Hope uh, had his own radio show, and right. I did, and he started, we were old pals from the Friars Club, and we right. played the Capitol Theater together, and he, I knew him very well, and he started kidding me about my, I was a little ample in, in the waist in those days, and he called me a uh, pot, you know, how did you, the only pot I ever saw had, it didn't have a rainbow over it, stuff like that. Right. And he, then I'd kid him about his, his nose, and about his bad jokes, and it got to be kind of a pseudo feud, you know, like Winchell had with, uh, was it Bernie? Winchell? Ben Bernie. Ben yeah, Bernie. and then there was a feud, Fred Allen and uh, Jack Benny. Jack Benny. Make believe. Make believe. Yeah, they were bosom pals, and so were Bob and I. And the feud developed and got funny. And then I was on his show, and we'd do the same humor, and he was on mine, the same thing. And then finally, somebody at the studio, I think it was Buddy De Silva, who was the uh, head of Paramount then. Right. He said, why don't we put these two guys together? And uh, they got Frank Hartman and uh, Don Hartman and Frank Butler to write. Uh, the first one was rode to Singapore. They figured they'd try it once. That's right. It looked like a one-time shot. 
and uh, we had lived a lot, and we had directors who were very tolerant, uh, Dave Butler and uh, guys like that, Victor Schertzinger, just let us do anything we wanted, and uh, the writers used to come on the set, and we'd say, if you hear a line that's yours, holler bingo, and then we'd go right back to work. And that was a lucrative celluloid road. Very good. I think we made eight, seven or eight of them. Could there be a road to yesteryear or a road well, to nostalgia? What are talking about? One road to tomorrow. But you, you know, Joe, two old gaffers like us, we can't chase the chicks anymore. No, too old. We can't have a rivalry over the leading lady. I mean, Nobody the believe are too, it. You're too young. And the chicks would get away. We wouldn't be able to catch them anyhow. Road to the bank. Road to tomorrow, it's called. And they had a treatment and hope, sent it back to the writer, said, if you can invest this with some lunacy like Marty Feldman, uh, Mel Brooks, uh, right. Monty Python's flying, those kind of things, he said, we'll, we'll take a shot at it. And that's what's happening now. Maybe if he can get it real crazy, we'll, we'll do it. My first job, I, I want to bring in Catherine Crosby. We're going to be officially Let's invited here, yeah, to, the, uh, of to the uh, Uber Theater. My first job, I was a teenage record picker in 1950, 51, for Paul Whiteman's Coast to Coast Disc Jockey Show, and he would always come on here and talk about his proteges. Yeah. But he would talk about you every single day. You were at, at the height of his fame. Being was he was he a nice man? All Great the time? man, really? funny, very funny Paul guy. White. He used Pops. to conduct a band, you know, and he'd be playing right. the Rhapsody in Blue or something with his back to the audience. He'd be making all kinds of faces. He right. could do things with his mustache. He could turn it right up like that, and he'd be beating the guys trying to play all those notes. He was clowning all the time, but a great sense of humor and very immaculate dress. Beautifully, all his clothes were tailored, his shoes were custom made. And he used to talk being what you did during the war without a lot of publicity. He, he was very, uh, other people used to have a lot of press agents. He's, he called you, uh, he quoted from some GI on the radio show, he called you Uncle Sam without whiskers. Is that never, what he said? I never forgot when he, that was nice. That must been the Stars and Stripes magazine. They used to write me up. They published all over the world, wherever the troops were. Did you ever think of having whiskers or a mustache? Or well, I wore whiskers in a couple of pictures, nothing happened. Make believe ones, right? Yeah. I had a beard. I grew a beard for a thing called Dr. Cook's Garden. My daughter and my wife loved it. I, I almost let it go. Kept it up, but I shaved it after the Ladies and gentlemen, I think I want to be at that Eurus Theater many, many... Oh, one more. Oh, somebody just handed me... What's that? The top radio... This is my friend over there, Herb Curtin, Radio Stars. And the winner of the poll in this particular year was Bing Crosby for the boys yeah. and Annette Hanshaw for the ladies. What do you want to Who's say that, about Jimmy Melton? Jimmy Melton, Jessica Dragonette, Joe Penner, Jimmy Wallington, Donna Michi. June Meredith, Rudy, Rudy Valley, and Guy Lombardo. I'll be done. How about Annette Hanshaw? Was she uh, singer? Very nice, great, great lady. Yeah, great lady. Ladies and gentlemen, what magazine was that? Radio, Radio Star? Stars, 1933. You've pumped me up, Joe, immeasurably. I we, feel happy now. We, I was once important, huh? We are going. We are going down memory lane with the most important news on Broadway right now. The fact that Bing Crosby is back on Broadway for the first time in how many years? About somebody told me 41. I can't believe it because. It's actually not accurate because I did a lot of shows with Sullivan in front of an audience. I did Benefits with Hope at Madison Square Garden, Hotel Astoria, through the years. Actually, it's true, though, because I never did a show which I headed up in 41 years. It's almost unbelievable that we have the chance to see Bing Crosby in person on Broadway, and I can't wait for that opening night. That's Tuesday night. I hope it lives up to the promise that gotta be, you seem to think it offers. It's got to be unbelievable. It's just... Uh, we'll something. do our best. The family will support me adequately. We'll, we'll be there with the family. We're going to be one part of that family following these words. Don't forget our schedule every morning and every night, and our recommendations always go something like this. Let's watch. That's uh, 12th Street Rag, I think it is. 12th Street Rag, which goes uh, a long time down memory lane. Before I bring in Catherine Crosby officially, I've been asked, even though it's been asked a million times, everybody wants me to ask again, even though you probably told the story, how did Harry Lillis become Bing? Because I've heard, I've heard three versions. Oh, I'll give you the authentic version. I was a kid about three or four years old, and there was a comic strip current then called the Bingville Bugle. Uh, you know, it was a long time of the Cast and Jammer kids, uh, Happy Hooligan. And uh, there was a character in there called Bingo. And the guy next door, who's about three or four years older than myself, called Valentine Hobart. Sounds like a riverboat gambler. <laughs> he called me Bingo, and then they dropped the O, and it was Bing. But my mother always called me Harry. Because other people say that you were playing cowboys and Indians oh, no. and that's, saying Bing, Bing, Bing. That's not true. That's the version. That's the true version. Another lady with that same coziness and that comfortable uh, penchant for making us feel at ease and happy and relaxed, and she sits up there. So H how about you introducing Catherine Crosby to the well, audience? Well, this is a little girl from West Columbia, Texas, who came to Paramount Theater where I was working, and she was under contract there, and she was doing a column for her local paper, her impressions of Hollywood and the people she met. And she came by the dressing room. I saw her walking by, a uh, very prim little, little Texas girl. 
bouncing along. And I said, hi, Tex, and she stopped and we had tea. And that started a friendship which later developed into a romance and finally led to the altar. Wouldn't you have stopped? <laughs> <laughs> There's nobody in the world that wouldn't have dropped their petticoats. She stopped and came in and we Catherine, had, we, in we had high way, tea. And, and the rest is beautiful history. In, in the way of what you have learned from being Mrs. Bing Crosby, in the way of uh, not a lesson or a sermon, but any, any philosophy of his lifestyle or what, what makes the world nicer or better, what's, uh, what's something? Th this could also go under the heading of, of tips for a happy married life, but oh. even though it sounds corny, but it, it ties together what, what, what has to rub off from being Mrs. Bing Crosby. Well, I think the, the overwhelming thing is music. Music. Joe, you know, uh, ease and, and uh, uh, nice and fun and music. Somebody said, isn't it, uh, you know, are there hardships uh, involved with uh, being Mrs. Bing Crosby? And I thought, yeah, if you don't like music, if you don't like uh, lovely friends that are warm and friendly to you, that ca it can get very tough. But if you like music, if you like people that are fond of your husband, and nothing can be more flattering, uh, it's terribly pleasing to me, Joe. I don't think we talked about it the other day, no. so don't blush, darling. Oh. But almost any woman in the... I've not met one woman in the world that wouldn't be delighted to be in my uh, size six no, and a half Bs. No, get out of here. And that's kind of nice. Who, who, who would have the final say if there was ever a difference of opinion, which I, which I can't uh, admit. Bing would have it? I don't think it's ever resolved any difference no. of opinion. She's very firm. She sticks with her beliefs, and I stick with mine. We just stop talking about it and let it go away, and finally it dissolves, and we forget about it. I can't imagine being cross. What do you want to say? That's a great thing he has taught me, uh, right. you know, Joe, because I, I was brought up to believe that difficulties must be faced and solved, and there are an awful lot of things in life that can't be solved and really don't have to be faced unless you are a masochist and like to look at unhappy things. And sometimes you just let things slide you go fishing or well, you, you talk about it as long as you can you don't it seems insoluble so the only thing you do is go fishing or go golfing and and then really the, the, the seriousness will be uh, will abate you know yeah. it's it's so true i never would have believed it but it is true things get easier after a while and the and the horror disappears uh, the fact that uh, a child comes home with a very bad grade is tragic for the moment but a couple of weeks down the line it's not so bad and and maybe the fact that they don't like the bad grade is more important than anything we think about it. And then if they're ready to make it better, that's, that's better still. You know. But bringing up children, being parents of Hollywood kids could tend to be a problem sometimes. It's, uh, it's, uh... I suppose uh, anybody having children nowadays is uh, tough. Tough. faced with problems. But what, what I did and uh, what Bing did, fortunately, we both had mothers that were pretty much alike. You just try right. to remember what did mother do right. in times of crisis and you usually hit or hug or Catherine, one of those Catherine things. I want to ask you a question how could Bing Crosby be so modest I want to ask you would you help me read something to the audience sure I've got the inside somebody asked Bing Crosby the secret of his great great success just the paragraph where it says every man and you got to tell me Bing if you really ever said that to the uh, right. to the newspaper man every man who sees one of my movies or who listens to my records or who hears me on the radio believes firmly that he sings as well as I do, especially when he's in the bathroom shower. It's no trick for him to believe this because I have none of the mannerisms of a trained singer and I have very little voice. Hmm. Now, Bing, how, I mean, you really said that once? Oh, I did, I believe, still think it's true. I think if I have any appeal, that's the reason for it. Did you I have any side, I don't put on any side, because no. I don't think I have any uh, right to put on any side or to be pompous. I don't think I'm that good, and I think a lot of fellas sing great. I've heard them around parties and stuff. Did you? Oh, by the way, there's one fella. I got to give you his album later on today. He's your number one fan after me, Steve Mason, who puts out these albums of Crosby. Sings Crosby, and, let's and see Columbo. what he sings. Ramona, I hear the mission bells above. Continue. I could tell the world how to smile. I could be all the if I had you. Call me darling. Call me darling. Call me that. You came to me from out of nowhere. When April showers, when bing, 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 da, da. First you put your two knees close I'll up tight, and then you wiggle to the left, and then you wiggle to the right. Where the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. Oh, how did this get in here? A good man is hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> A good man is hard to find. You often get the other kind. And just when you think that your man is great, you find that he's a think, and then you haul your freight. You made that up. I threw in that line, yeah. <laughs> then find we that he's a think, and then you one more chance to prove it's you alone that I fear for. It was a lucky April shower. 
It was the most convenient door. I found a million dollar baby in a five and ten cent store. Now this is Russ's song. I can't believe you, you can, now you call it madness and I call it love. I don't remember the first part of it. Then this was Alice Faye's great song. I don't know why I love, I love you, you like, like I, I do. do. I, I don't know why, why, but I do. Great song. This I'm gonna, I'm I cannot. I'm going to put some of those back in the medley. <laughs> this I can't believe. I want to ask my crew how do they feel about this homemade Bing Crosby medley. What about this? <laughs> how does you call it madness, sir? I uh, can't forget the night you... I can't. And now you call it madness. I call it madness. I mean, you call it love or vice versa. Mr. Crosby, Mr. Crosby, Mr. Crosby, Mr. Crosby. Yeah. I've been reading in the latest magazine. Oh, that's uh, Gallagher and Sheen. You Guy made that. Mercer. You. I know all your songs. Give me, give me, uh, uh, what's that thing? Walk in, be walk, walk in, walk in behind, walk in behind. Bing Crosby fan number one after me. That's that'll make you sound just like me if you got a sore throat because I always had a sore throat. Let me say, let me hear you sing uh, I Surrender, dear. We play the game, I'll stay away, but it costs more than I can pay. Without you, I can't make my way. I surrender, dear. Let's hear it for Steve Mason. One time for Steve Mason. Can you travel? Can you travel? Travel, I'll travel. We'll do a double. You got to do it. You got to do it. Yeah. Hey, Bing, listen, I want to say something. I put out a record to yeah. contribute to your 50 years of show business, yeah. and I'm donating the profits to cr cancer research. Good. And I'm getting right up. with your picture of me and, and all the papers. We He's a good man. This afternoon, didn't we? Right. Uh, I want to we'll, take a picture we'll take of you alone. Later. We'll yeah. take Stand it. Stand by. He's okay. a good man. There's a fellow who is really dedicated. He's got it, yeah. He's got it made. He's fabulous. You know, just for a publicity gag one time, I think it was about 1932, they had me enter a uh, Bing Crosby sing-alike contest. They didn't get to see the singers. And over in Brooklyn, I finished third. Bing Crosby went into a Bing Crosby sound alike contest and lost. Third. Uh, Finished third. Came in third. That's not bad, though, darling, if you keep well, working. I mean close. I, oh, close. I lost by about a furlong and a half. Bing, how about <laughs> one of your, how would you like to meet one of Bing's co stars in the big broadcast of 1932? I just for Arthur Tracy to see. Yes. Season. Just, well, let's hear it one time. Arthur, walk, walk around here. Marta, rambling rose of the wildwood, right? Bing, uh, Marta, rose. with her fragments divine, right? And you know the lyrics. Well, that's as far as I know. <laughs> Well, I'll teach you the rest. We'll go out and we'll do, do a job. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and, no, Catherine, do me one last favor, Catherine. This is, th no, th no, 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 nothing like that. By the way, have you been on Catherine's TV show, Bing? Yes, twice. Is, is, he, is he a good guest? He's okay. A little more work. A little breaking in. More polish. <laughs> no, the biggest thing, I think I told you, he, uh, he asked to come on the third time. That's funny. That was really Catherine, nice. yes. I don't want people to be disappointed. Let's make a nice invitation to the Eurus Theater because I think if, if they wait too long, you'll, you'll be sold out because it's a very brief engagement. Let's have an official... Uh, well, we're going to be, you know, listening to the, the songs he was singing. I don't think he needs the 32-piece orchestra, but Billy Barnes is going to be there. Billy Byers. Billy Byers, I beg your pardon, with the orchestra. And uh, we're going to have Joey Bushkin and the, and the jazz quartet and Rosemary Clooney, his very special girl and my friend, too, is going to be there singing duets and solos. And uh, Harry, Mary Frances, and Nathaniel are all going to be at the Eurus Theater from, we open the 7th, and we play uh, every night uh, up to the 19th, including the 19th, except for the Monday before, which is the 13th, we're done. We're out to the And we do hope that everybody's going to come down. If we don't get closed it. before the 19th, we'll you still be You think they'd run us out of town? I don't know. New York's tough, honey. Being Being that, that little bit of a homemade medley, did you, were, you, were you born with some kind of a photogenic uh, mind for lyrics and for movie lines, or was that, or was that something that was developed, or the way you can oh, retain it? Oh, I think it was, our family was musical. My father played mandolin. We had the first talking machine in the neighborhood. We always had music in the house, and we had records. I had all the McCormick records and the Franklin Bars and all those people, uh, uh, Gene Van Austin, Skank Van and Skank. all the orchestras, and I sang everything I could get my hands on. Nick Lucas? Nick Lucas, yes, and Ike, uh, Ukulele Ike, right. who was Cliff Edwards, and uh, a red-haired girl, what was her name? Arthur might know. All I know is that... Uh, we're Lee somebody. I promised Bing and Catherine... They Marion did. Harris. Marion Harris. Record. I've got to do just 30 seconds of White Christmas. I asked my friend Morris Katz to do one of his instant paintings for White Christmas. And just, this has to you be... Remember, yes. You remember, the end has come. My heart is numb. Yeah. But like a bolt from the blue above. That's from the big Now you broadcast. call it madness and I call it... No. 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 What was that? That's the big broadcast. Here lies love. Here lies love. Yeah. Very dramatic Lady. thing for me. Oh. Yes. Bing, I With just low lighting. 
I just <laughs> I just have to do this because it's uh, it's corny or it's schmalsy, but I, this is my favorite record, and I I played it on the radio. And Irving Berlin, watch it. You want what, what do you want to say about White Christmas or Mr. Berlin? And Mr. Berlin going to be listening. Every single Irving, time. how nice to talk to you. I made an album in England lately, and one of your songs is in it. And I think you'd like to hear it. I'm going to send you a copy. It's called When I Leave the World Behind. You remember that? Gorgeous. And White Christmas, of course, you know what it's done for me and how grateful I am to you. Made my career really musically. White Christmas. Uh, Anybody that gets a, 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 a stimulus like that, directly attributed to you, has to be eternally grateful, and I am. Catherine, when you look at Bing, it is so beautiful the way you look in his eyes, and she's almost the way you're talking to Irving Berlin. Well, that's, that's beautiful. Dear, that's really dear man. And Bing, you haven't changed. Oh you yes, no. slowed up a lot. Well, we all well, get better. All, just, of course. just a touch of the holiday time, a touch of what you'll be getting at the Eurus, a touch of the master, the biggest selling record ever made, White Christmas. And I'll be back soon with old time movie time. But just a sample of this, please. It's long overdue for his next appointment, but I've got to ask Mrs. Crosby to tell us one time what she just told me, how or why she fell in love with Bing Crosby. Not his singing voice, but his. The speaking voice. Yes. Well, you were the one that picked it up Bing's because you said his the speaking quality of his voice. Arthur, he speaks better than almost anybody sings. Oh, it's impossible to be real. angry with him when he's at now. Imagine on. if they had if they had modern recording techniques in 1931 with stereo, yeah. right? Yeah, with the electronic systems they have now. Yeah. Boy, being at the Eurus with the family, these words, and I'll be back with old time movie time. Let's hear it one time for the Crosby family and Arthur Thank Tracy. You. Thank you.